uh, but we need to really concentrate on how we as individuals work together to minimize our exposures to risk. And I think that's the common denominator from level one through level five in dealing with all of the issues that the uh, questioner just uh, put forward to us. Thank you. Our next call is from Mexico. It's from the Instituto Tecnológico de Tijuana. It's in the city of Tijuana, in the state of Baja California, in Mexico. Muy buenos días. Good morning. On behalf of the Instituto Tecnológico of Tijuana, I thank you for taking our question, and my question is the following. If we take into account that a higher education is the foundation of our country, what are the risks and how can we face them with direct collaboration from a, for example, of a, a very important standpoint in the human life, for example, how can we base, how can education be the foundation of um, the country's future? Thank you very much. Bob, how would you like to talk about that? And Dan, I'll give you a chance to take a shot at it. Too. I think that uh, education is key to helping all of us understand the significance of relationships, uh, exposing individuals to differences, um, exposing people to the learning process is key. I think without education, uh, it would be impossible to deal with or minimize risk. Uh, we have to uh, institutionalize risk management uh, via an educational process. So education is, is the primary goal or the pri should be the primary objective for, for every uh, country in terms of uh, understanding relationships. Dan, you agree? I, I do agree. In fact, I think that, that institutions of higher education should be the vehicle, if, if not one, the primary vehicle by which people understand risk, people understand the threats to operations and businesses, not, notwithstanding the, the threats that they may um, ha be faced with at the school themselves. But the higher education institution should be that vehicle to create new technologies, to create new ways to attack risk and threats. And uh, I think it's a great forum to do so. We have another call from Mexico. This one is from the Universidad Liceo Cervantino. It is in the city of Irapuato, in the state of Guanajuato, in the country of Mexico. Muy buenos días. This is for Mr. Robert Brown. Why do you consider that the risk that comes from the administrating human capital is more important than risk that comes from infrastructure or from the environmental risk? Thank you very much. I think that every, everything originates from how we interact with each other. Um, human and uh, or people are the common denominator for dealing with all the other risks that we're exposed to. For example, if you don't have the relationships where people understand uh, the significance of uh, an environmental impact, then um, you don't have a way of dealing with it. Uh, we can't expect uh, machines to do that for us. So we need to work together and understand emotions and interactions and how people uh, just deal with each other in order to to deal with or uh, or minimize any risk. So the social capital of just working together, a consensus building, collaborative designs, um, taking into consideration, again, the emotional component of our daily existence is extremely important. And without that, we cannot move forward on dealing with the other risks that, are, that we are exposed to. Our next call is from Ecuador. It is from MAR y Compañía Consultores. It's in the city of Manta, in Ecuador. Good morning. I would like to say hi to everybody there. Our question is the following. For a person to be a manager of risk in a company, what kind of qualifications should this person have? Thank you very much. Dan, why don't you start with that one Dan, as well? Yeah, historically, what <clears throat> what I've seen in, in, in the practical context, uh, risk managers are leaders. They're identifiers of, 
as Bob said, human capital that can make a difference in an organization. But more importantly, they're able to quantify and qualify the threats to an organization to achieve primarily one thing. It's the goals, identifying the goals and objectives of an organization to overcome and manage that risk, whether it be financial or operational. Uh, th that's what I see is, is the primary difference is in that leadership capability and uh, getting organizations to move cohesively toward a goal of managing risk. Bob, what do you think? Uh, Dan is correct in that. Um, I think risk managers, uh, first of all, like like he explained, need to have some basic qualifications, but I think probably the most important qualification is, is uh, learning, having the, the skills to deal with people. Um, and like Dan said, to, to be able to not only quantify, but qualify uh, those dealings. Our next call is from Mexico. It's from La Universidad de Sonora in the city of Hermosillo in the state of Sonora in Mexico. Good morning to all our associated colleagues to this magnificent video conference network. My comment and question in regard to this context that is so complex is extremely important in all of the everyday activities as human beings, I would focus my concern in this um, risk management in terms of what uh, Robert Lee Brown uh, commented in on the human aspect. I believe that the human aspect is extremely important and this has to be a part of our society and I believe that more than really um, have professionals, risk professionals or security experts, we should really generate a sort of culture and this way of doing it, the more traditional way is to do it through education institutions, through schools. And I would suggest that according to the different developments in the, in the five different development levels or, the, or these solutions for these problems, what would be the strategy that we could apply, we as educational institutions, in order to develop this culture in our society? Thank you very much. Let me let me indicate where we we have to be quick. Dan, I'm going to throw this one to you. He's already agreed with Bob. I don't know that you disagree, and but you still see the role of a security mm -hmm. advisor is important. So could you give us a quick synopsis? Oh, I, I think the role of a security advisor is is essential. And what I would suggest as sort of an overarching thought is that you look at each and every individual from a contingency perspective, what the impact will be if they're not there in what an organization or school will do, for example, if that person's not there to back up that capacity and capability. Integrates business continuity thought with risk management thought. Great. Thank you for your questions. Let's now move to the second module of our program, in which Dan Hopwood was interviewed by ITC associate uh, Frank Stanassis. Dan, it's good to see you again. Thanks, Welcome. Frank. It's good to be here. Appreciate it. Uh, risk management has long been a traditional management tool. Reflecting on your extensive experience in developing it and implementing business continuity plans, can you tell us where the core competencies of business continuity planning merge with those of traditional risk management? I'll give that a shot, Frank. It's a great question, and, and I think there probably are three, maybe four primary areas. The first is in the identification of, of risk, however it's defined inside of an organization to begin with. Does risk exist? How big is the risk? Secondarily, uh, I think they both match up in an organization's desire to mitigate risk. In other words, go out and reduce the ability of, of a risk to manifest or to reduce the size of the risk. Yeah. Lastly, and, and perhaps at least from my perspective, the most important when it comes to the business continuity piece, is, is or are the development of contingencies, plans, ways to attack risk as, it, as you identify it in the manifestation stage, as it begins to uh, unfold, a natural hazard, a hurricane, uh, a violence in the workplace, that you have the plans and the contingencies 
to address that risk and reduce it to its lowest possible levels? Yes. Does, what role does business continuity planning play in an organization's overall strategic initiatives? Yeah, I wish more organizations would think about business continuity as they strategize and plan. You know, if you think about the word strategy, the development of, of approaches and, and ways to um, create business emergence and create new markets, it, business continuity really is a tactic. It's the tactical application of the strategy. So what you're looking at is the implementation phase of, of, of attacking risk, creating plans that when your organization uh, has struggles with personnel issues, uh, human, human capital, um, technical issues, mm -hmm. that you've got the resiliency. So it's in that strategic planning that you're looking down one or two or three additional levels to protect and create a cushion for your organization. Does each type of risk that we learn about in Module 1 require a separate business continuity plan? I think, I, I think I'd like to answer that one yes and no. Uh, the, 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 the no is predominant in that you have to have an overarching business continuity plan. In other words, a, a clear direction in which you're going to take your organization when something develops. Yes. And by something, I mean a risk, mm -hmm. a, a problem. Yeah. The, the, the yes part really comes into play based on the individual nature of the risk that's manifested. In other words, in the emergency response aspect of business continuity, and, and the, the listeners may remember that from two or three presentations ago yeah. on business continuity, we talked about that element. And some emergencies require specialized plans, hazardous material, violence in the workplace. They have to have some specifics uh, as to how you respond and react. So to that level, yes, it has to be unique. Generally, though, you want an overarching plan that drives the organization in one direction when, when something is occurring. Yes, okay. Now, looking at business models and business processes, they become more complex with partner relationship, reliance on supply chain partners, right. and multi-node logistics. Is there a compounding effect toward business continuity? Yeah, there really is. What it does is it makes, it makes business continuity planning, I believe, more complex and more critical in organizations. When you look at, at, um, at companies that are now relying on things that this program has talked about many times, just in time, lean manufacturing, yeah. you know, they're, they're relying on business partners, suppliers, and logistic partners to get materials and goods and services on site right now. And if those aspects of the operation are impacted, your business continuity plans must be so rigorous that you can overcome that dynamic yeah. if, if it's harmed in the process. So that part of business continuity planning is becoming much, much more critical. Keeping that in mind, how do logistics help paint the picture for concerns that emanate from globalization? And, and what role should business continuity play in this? Well, part of the the response to a business continuity problem has to do with, uh, if you look at incident management, one of the elements of incident management is logistics. In other words, the acquisition of capital. Sometimes I mean yes. money. Yes. Sometimes I mean people. And sometimes you mean the goods and services necessary to recover business operations. So when you look at logistics, it, it means all of that. And uh, oftentimes you have to go outside the organization to acquire uh, the logistics requirements. Uh, sometimes you, you develop them internally. But uh, again, we're really looking at uh, beefing up a continuity plan, Frank, that, that uh, has identified those logistic needs ahead of time so that you can turn them on right away when they're needed. When you consider systems, are you referring to the systems approach to business continuity or actual systems that drive the organizational engines. Yeah, yeah. the, the organizational systems that, that drive an organization, um, they oftentimes are a risk. Yes. They also are tools for response. But when I speak about the systems approach in business continuity, I, I'm really referring to looking at the ability to what I refer to as ping, P-I-N-G. And that's to send out signals to tell us, are we continuously identifying risk? 
Are we continuously identifying our ability to recover from risk if it manifests? So from that system's approach, we identify risk, we mitigate risk, and we're really looking at the ability to systematically assess things on a continuous basis. So from that system's approach, uh, really what I'm referring to is that business continuity is not linear. Yes. It's not step by step by step. Yes. It is cyclical. What makes a systems approach towards business continuity more effective for an organization than, say, other approaches? I think the systems approach, Frank, is, is critical because it doesn't allow the planning process to, to go fallow or to go, to go stale. Yeah. If, if you do the linear approach in planning, which a lot of planners do, business continuity planners, once they've identified risk and written plans, it, that plan will sit around and become stale. Whereas in that systems approach with that pinging I talk about, yes. much like sonar, much like yeah. things they do in the defense industries, you're continuously looking for information. And that doesn't allow your plan to go stale because sometimes you need to modify it frequently, not just annually, yes. not just every two or three years, perhaps uh, weekly, daily. Think about terrorism. Exactly. You know, we, we have to modify and, and seek information all the time. And that's really what I'm talking mm. about there. Yeah, in, in the past, you have mentioned um, RTOs and right. RPOs. Uh, could you refresh our memory on those terms yeah. and, and what yeah. they mean for um, the continuity planning? Sure. Organizations uh, must be capable of establishing in, in the context of business continuity, RTOs, which are recovery time objectives. And they have to be realistic. Yes. Uh, what, we, what we find a lot in planning with, with organizations uh, are that they, they think that they need to recover their core businesses within 12 hours or 24 hours or 36 hours, but yeah. they don't have the horses to pull it off. So what we try to do is to get organizations to become realistic in recovery time objectives. Mm -hmm. The RPO, on the other hand, really is referring to that point at which you must begin the recovery process. Okay. That, that outward bound time that says, I have to start now. Whereas the RTO really refers to that time that you have to have your operations back up and running to meet customer demand, perhaps regulatory uh, compliance uh, issues, and, and those types of factors. Okay, thanks. Now, now. Why would organizations worry about continuity planning in the first place? Can't they make business plans and predict outages and accommodate them with insurance of economic reserves? Yeah, they, they, they can. And, and, and the development of business plans and the prediction of outages really is part and parcel of continuity planning. Okay. The insurance piece, though, is becoming much harder to calculate and, and predict in terms of one, its availability, and two, its okay. cost. So part of what we're trying to accomplish is, is to have organizations have recovery and contingency plans to maintain operations to certain levels, to get back into business so that the, the, the need to go out and utilize that insurance program is diminished, okay. thus controlling costs mm -hmm. and other factors. Fact of the matter is, yeah. in the world market, some insurance is becoming hard to get, business interruption, contingent business interruption, what are referred to as the time elements. Uh, not only are they hard to get, they're becoming very costly. Yes. So, so the planning for maintaining business on your own is much more crucial now. Yes. Now, in past presentations, you mentioned that emergencies, crisis, and disasters are really three fundamentally different things. Right. Can't you simply roll a continuity planning out in a manner that addresses them all without making these specific distinctions? Well, the, the, the continuity plan, Frank, must, at least in, in my belief, incorporate all three. And in fact, when um, certain events happen to um, various magnitudes, you, you actually roll all those plans out in parallel. Okay. The, the fact of the matter is, if, if for example, take the crisis piece. For many, that's dealing with communications, mm -hmm. brand management, reputation management. If you do not have a plan to either internally manage that or to bring in external experts, you're not going to fundamentally succeed in your continuity plan because your yes. customers, your clients 
are not going to know where you stand in your recovery efforts. So <clears throat> a singular plan, excuse me, may not address all of those issues. Therefore, you have to attack them individually. But the, the, the fact of the matter is that we tend to roll them out in parallel. Yes, that, that makes sense. Essentially depending on the magnitude of the event. Yes. The larger it is, the more likely you're to engage all of them. Now, looking at the future, what economic and political dynamics do you think will develop over the next several years that will impact the way that one does continuity planning? I, I believe we're going to have some, some force issues, Frank. Take, for example, what's going on in the United States with many of, um, you know, what even last year were our leading organizations, WorldCom, Enron, MCLONE. Yeah. Many of these organizations that we saw really as, as the bellwethers to, to some of our economic success, successes are struggling. So on the financial side, what we're going to see is that organizations are going to have to validate to their customers, their shareholders, regulatory mm -hmm. bodies, that they have business continuity capabilities. And in fact, many of those validations, I believe in time, yeah. are going to be politically and regulatorily mandated. So it, it's probably a good time to start that process wherever we are in the world. Mm -hmm. Get on that now. So because th those two things are going to come in parallel, and they're likely to come very fast. Do you think that that's a global trend? At, on the economic side, yes. Think about a developing economy or a developing company. The best thing they could do is to have business continuity plans yes. ready to rock and roll. Yes. In the absence of those you're going to hope that there's economic support capital credit lines and they may not be available so you're going to have to have a way to maintain your business yeah. now, it would appear to me that training and education are really essential elements of sound business continuity planning right, right. now if that's true how do you capitalize on their benefits in continuity related programs? Is there something specific that you should do? Yes, and, and I probably would concentrate on the training piece and, and think about it this way. If, if training is the applied side, in other yes. words, the practice and the proof that you can deploy your business continuity plans, it is, it, it is almost, it's almost not worth it to have a business continuity plan if you cannot validate that you can deploy yes. it and make it work yes so I, I think the training piece is not only essential it, it mm. in my mind is mandatory and um, what I would recommend to all organizations that that embark on business continuity planning is that they test each aspect of it emergency response especially yes you know depending on the nature of the event the people that respond to that emergency must be capable of meeting yes. minimum requirements you won't know that unless you practice. And that's that, the training piece. That makes sense. Yeah. Now, who in an organization will be responsible for that? In fact, who should own a business continuity plan in an organization? Yeah. Uh, you know, in, in sort of a systems approach, Frank, I, I, it would be easy to say everybody should own it. Uh, I, yes. uh, you know, but, but I believe in, in leadership. And uh, it doesn't mean that the CEO or the president should own it. They really should understand. They really should be involved. Mm -hmm. Depends on the kind of organization. Okay. If it's a financial-driven organization, maybe the CFO uh, or the financial office owns it. Manufacturing, operations, logistics type. It might be the operations uh, mm -hmm. folks. Different people will own the plan in terms of, of managing and maintaining it. Others will own different pieces of it. The safety manager might be responsible for the emergency response part. Yes. While yes. the business continuity, the business recovery piece may be more of a financial um, determination. Yes. So it depends on the nature of the plan. But someone high, this is, this is the, the critical piece. Someone high enough in the organization okay. that they can maintain and mandate that the program is maintained, updated, and practiced and that it's got some legitimacy in the organization. Yes, yes. Now, based on your experience then, what's the first step an organization should take to get started with business continuity planning? Yeah, traditionally, most 
organizations are encouraged to start to identify the threats or risks that could harm their business. Okay. To categorize those threats and risks. Bob talks in his program about uh, human, the, the yes. technical, yes. Uh, the operational and financial threats. Those are good ways to categorize threats. That's one way to do it. And then once you identify those threats, you, you move toward mitigation and developing plans. There is a strong movement afoot to, to not abandon that, but yeah. to modify it by making an assumption at the organizational level that an operation has been rendered um, non-existent. Your okay. building is a smoking hole. Yes. Your product line is gone. And that you plan based on that worst case scenario. And we're doing a, an awful yes. lot of planning with organizations based on that versus the identification of threats. Yes. Fundamentally, you get to the same place. It's just a different way of attacking it to begin with. Now, would an organization normally start something like this on their own initiative? Or um, um, what do they typically do and yeah. what's most effective? There, there is, uh, well, the fact that an organization starts is, is the most effective piece. Now, what drives okay. that, that starting mechanism is changing. Many yes. times the, the drive was because business owners and managers felt the need to safeguard their employees, their shareholders, their customers. Others uh, feel the need to do it because someone tells them they have to do it. Yes. And, and today we know with some of the examples I used before um, with WorldCom and MClone and others that the, the regulatory and, and the securities world is saying prove to your shareholders that you can safeguard their investment. Yes. So the, the driving nature really is broken up into three or four components. Okay. Good moral um, determination is an important thing to do. Sometimes it's financially driven. Yeah. Other times the regu regulatory bodies drive it. Now, if it's driven by operation and efficiencies, is there a way that we can manage how it impacts your competitiveness? Uh, I, I believe so, Frank. Uh, in other words, if we're looking at business, in, in fact, that's one way to validate business continuity planning. Uh, yes, it, it yes. is to say that in the absence of planning capability, we're going to begin to lose market share. Yeah, it's an odd twist that an organization would say, in an event, not only am I going to maintain market share, I want to grow. It can happen. There have been case studies that suggest that organizations that respond quickly and effectively create a wonderful um, sort of public relations dynamic, if you will. And the people that buy their products and services say, I like these guys, and I'm going to keep buying it, as opposed to, nah, they're not in business anymore, so I'll go to a competitor. Yes. Yeah. Now, you talked about um, mandates and regulations and laws. Right. They might be able to make us, as a business community, do certain things, but does that mean that we actually do business continuity planning the right way? Do you see a, a conflict there? There can be a disconnect, and, and I think the disconnect is in the applied side of continuity planning. There are millions of fine-looking business continuity plans sitting on people's shelves. Okay. that are not used, not practiced, not validated. So that distinction is going to be on the applied side of being able to deploy that plan, make it work, and to do it within those time frames, whether they're the RPOs or the RTOs that an organization has established. Okay. Thank you, Dan. You're welcome, Frank. Appreciate the time. We will now continue with the second question and answer session. Our first call is from Mexico. It is from the Instituto Politecnico Latino Americano in the state of Pachuca. I'm in the city of Pachuca in the state of Hidalgo in Mexico. This is the Instituto Tecnológico Latinoamericano. My question is for an education institution. Would it be convenient to have a manual of risk if we, of course, have in our community um, teachers and faculty um, that would really like to um, know your opinion on this regard? 
Dan, what do you think? As an organization, should the university have it? Y yeah, uh, I think the manual of risk, if you will, or the development of a uh, a risk or a threat matrix, which includes not only the existence of a risk or threat, but how big it might be, is critical to several things. One is managing that risk, and two is creating response programs uh, surrounding that risk. So absolutely, whether it's done on a department basis or an institution-wide basis, that's a really good approach. It's a great prototypical start to business continuity planning, by the way, as well. Great. We now have a call from Colombia. It is from the Federación Nacional de Comerciantes, known as FENALCO, in the city of Medellín, in Colombia. Muchas gracias. Buenos días. Buenos días. Our question is the following. What type of contingencies can you set forth when the plan for administrating risks is in now focused um, wrongly on the less important risks? What can we do in this regard? Wow, that, that's a wonderful question, and, and I, I hope I understand where you're going with that. But if you're focusing on threats to business operations that are one less likely to happen and two less large if you will then what the contingency that we must rely on is the rigor of your response planning so that regardless of the threat that manifests you have a plan in place that logically works you through a response methodology so that at least you're hitting the basics and at least you're maximizing the, the the effort for responding to that, that risk. And that's the contingency, I think, is having a plan that works regardless of the magnitude of the event in terms of its logical steps. We have another call from Mexico. It is from La Universidad de Occidente. It's in the city of Los Mochis. It's in the state of Sinaloa in Mexico. Sí, muchas gracias. Buenos días. Our question is focused on uh, Robert Brown's presentation, and it has to do with if risk is reduced by um, diversification, what, how can we then focus diversification in the human factor? Thank you very much. Well, I want to make sure that I understand that question correctly, um, but if I don't, uh, just bear with me. Um, diversification from a human standpoint, uh, what I understand it to be is embracing uh, the differences in a different way of uh, just being on a daily basis. Um, diversica diversification uh, to me means trying to understand and value the difference differences that you're going to be exposed to. Dan alluded to earlier about um, uh, we talked about a manual. Well, if uh, consider um, incorporating your risk management policies and procedures, uh, your risk management program into your policies and procedure, and focus, uh, uh, construct a, a, a part of that policy and procedure to deal with um, how we treat people, incorporate the fact that people are different, uh, that we need to understand the differences, and that we live in a global society where uh, understanding those differences and being diversified can mean the difference between uh, success and failure. We now have a call from the Universidad Tecnológica de Nezahualcoyotl. It's in the city of Nezahualcoyotl, in the state of Mexico, in the country of Mexico. You talked about that it is recommendable to have an internal audit or special um, people that will audit this. In Mexico, this is costly. My question is, what do you... Um,